welcome to the LB's The Lover of Books author chat. If this is your first time here or watching the recording, hello. And again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, LB The Lover of Books, where you will find 43 recorded author chats posted there with over 8,300 hours watched. So I'm betting you find something that you've read that you can go back and watch again because it's um, really cool to see inside that author's brain. Um, also, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Now to introduce this best-selling author. Kristen Harmel is a New York Times best-selling, USA Today best-selling, and number one international best-selling author of The Forest of Vanishing Stars, The Book of Lost Names, The Winemaker's Wife, and a dozen other novels that have been translated, get this, into more than 30 languages and sold all over the world. I can't wait to hear some of those cool countries. Um, she's been writing professionally since she was 16 when she began her career as a sports writer. And yes, I will be asking her about that. <laughs> Covered Major League Baseball, NHL hockey for a local magazine in Tampa Bay in the late 1990s. In addition to a long magazine writing career, primarily writing and reporting for People magazine, as well as other articles of American Baby, Men's Health, Women's Day, and more, she also was a frequent contributor to the national television morning show, The Daily Buzz. She sold her first novel in 2004, and it debuted in 2006. She was born, is anybody here from Boston, Massachusetts? She spent her childhood there as well as in Worthington, Ohio, and St. Petersburg, Florida. She graduated with a degree in journalism, minor in Spanish from the University of Florida, and I think she spent her time pretty much there since then. But she did live a little bit in Paris and L.A. She now lives in Orlando with her husband and young son, and we are going to end this call a little bit early because Kristen needs to put him to bed, which we all understand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the other really cool thing, which I'm sure most of you already know, she is also a co-founder and co-host of the popular weekly web show and podcast, Friends and Fiction, which we all love. But today we're here to talk about her newest, The Paris Daughter. It's a gripping historical novel about two mothers who must make unthinkable choices in the face of Nazi occupation. Welcome, Kristen. Welcome. Thank, Thank you so much you. for coming. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we are so excited. Um, I guess the first thing I want to know is what made you pick this novel this time? Like, what was it that grabbed you? Oh, man. Um, well, okay. So if you followed my career, if anyone out there has followed my career at all, I, um, I've i been writing World War II fiction for about um, a about 14 years now. My first World War II novel was The Sweetness of Forgetting. I wrote it in 2010. It came out in 2012. And in those years I've been doing that type of writing, I've only written one non-World War II book. So that time period just really, really interests me. Um, but each book has led to something, some spark that has sparked the next book. Like the, the research for the previous book has led to that spark. And so for this one, I believe that the first spark of the book was thinking about what it would have been like to live in an occupied country like France and to live under the constant threat of Allied bombing. So in the suburbs of Paris during World War II, the Allies were frequently dropping bombs because there was a German automobile factory, well, there was an, a German controlled automobile factory that was producing um, uh, tanks and other vehicles for war. So the Allies were bombing it to take them out of commission, but every time they bombed it, um, there were bombs that fell outside of the perimeter of the building and fell on civilian areas. So, um, you know, I, I had talked during the research for the Book of Lost Names, my 2020 novel, I had talked to some people who had been hidden children during World War II. And one of the things that everyone seemed to mention was that idea of the air raid sirens going off having to get to a safe place, like that was just burned into their memories, even, you know, 70 or 80 years later. So I think that was the jumping off point for this book. Um, and then all the, all the other elements of it kind of were layered in as I went along. Well, we know you love and are tremendously interested in the World War II. Why that time period, first of all, and I believe it was Diane that wanted to know, did you have a family? Oh, sorry, Maggie. Is, did you have a family member that fought in World War II or do you have some connection to that time period that really so, connects you? Yeah, good question. So um, so both of my grandfathers did serve in the military during World War II. Um, 
and I think probably part of what drew me to it initially was that idea of reconnecting, you know, with these stories that they never told. It was something that that my grandparents lived through as young adults, all four of my grandparents. Um, and, uh, and, and they just kind of took their stories with them. You know, I, I think that generation didn't necessarily share the way that maybe we do today. They didn't tell their stories, especially the traumatic stories. So I think that was part of it. Um, I do have, um, my dad's side of the family is Jewish. And so I think that that probably, there's a piece of my interest in the Holocaust that comes from that. Um, and um, just in general, World War II, I think, um, is a really interesting time period to me. It feels very relevant today. I think there are still a lot of lessons to be learned from the Second World War today. But I didn't know this was something I was going to be interested in. I lived in Paris when I was in my early 20s. And, um, you know, I had been interested in World War II history and specifically Holocaust history. I had loved the Diary of Anne Frank. You know, I, I had been so moved and so touched by that book when I was a young teenager. And I think that had always stayed with me. But I didn't realize until I lived in Paris how much Holocaust history had happened right there in this city that we associate with just you know, light and celebration and, and architecture and all of these things that are good, right? But France really had um, quite a, um, a Holocaust history. And I didn't know that until I lived there. And that was, I think, the first spark in making me want to write about it. And I think that that, um, that that ultimately became my first World War II book, The Sweetness of Forgetting, which came out in 2012. And once I had written one, um, I just, I, I didn't want to leave the research behind. I tried to write one non-World War II book and I just missed the research. I missed writing about the time period. I missed writing about the people. I missed writing about the way we find our light when we're um, thrust into the darkness. It just pulled you right back in. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm, I'm like you know, an addict. I can't stop. <laughs> well, it, well, we're glad that you're addicted to it because <laughs> obviously we just dive right in. So, you know, a lot of the novel is this polar opposite feel. Um, and we do talk spoilers here because everybody um, has read this, or at least they they know we're going to talk spoilers. So I'm going to jump a little bit to the end, because when you said, you know, we think of Paris as light, you know, the Eiffel Tower, Montmartre, all these beautiful things. Elise is coming back into town and she's seeing people smiling and celebrating and she is not in that headspace. Yeah. Yeah. And that polar opposite, because that's kind of what we think of as Paris, but yet she is walking into a much darker yeah. Paris than, than what everyone else that she sees around. Well, and, and I, I think that that's kind of, um, that was kind of the case I, for a lot of people, I, I think, after World War II. There was so much darkness after World War II. There was so much loss, so much devastation. Um, but I, I, But people did find their way back. But, you know... Thinking about opposites like that, I I do think that tends to be the case. Like you you notice the um you notice those moments of happiness and joy and all of that sometimes a little bit more when you're in your darkest places because that is really hard. Like it's hard to see celebration going on, you know, two feet away from you when you feel like your life is ending. You know what I mean? And and I think that was something that did make it more difficult. Um, for Elise and, and also for Juliet um, as life moved on um, and they were kind of mired in place, if that makes sense. Definitely. We do talk or you, you, we talk or you talk about miscarriages and I know that I'm making a jump, but we, when we talk about how far we've come yeah. from World War II to now, it's a little bit different of a perspective. I think when we talked about World War II, veterans not wanting to talk about their experiences. Women didn't really want to talk about that experience of tragedy yeah. either. And maybe now, hopefully it's more of a conversation. How did you decide to tackle that topic in almost same terms? Because it was a different time and place. It, it was a different time and place. Um, you know, I, I, I assume you're talking about uh, Juliet. Yep. Juliet, Juliet yes, at the beginning of the book. You know, I, I, I think I, um, I wanted to have Juliet have a deep, loss that had begun to shape her that it, so you could see the way grief had shaped her and was going to shape her and it gave her a reason to stay in Paris um, because her little 
daughter was buried there. So I think it gave her um, a reason to stay when perhaps she should have been more focused on getting herself and her children out. Um, so uh, I, I think that was kind of the logic with that. It wasn't so much a desire to to um, tackle, um, in, you know, infant death as, as it was just, you know, we all lose things in different ways. There are all different kinds of losses. They all affect us differently. They sear us differently. Um, and, and Juliet was someone who I think had a particular difficulty dealing with the things that she lost along the way. And I said miscarriage. I should have said infant loss. Um, oh no, that, that that's okay. Actually, you made me think I was like, did I end up writing it as a miscarriage? Like maybe I did. You, you know, that it's so funny. Like, I, like a couple of, so the book came out almost a year ago. It came out June of last year. Um, it, it's about to come out in paperback, but that means I had completed it like a year before that. And it's funny to be on the road, like talking about a book that you wrote two, two or more years ago, because sometimes people will ask questions like that, that you don't get very often. And you're like, huh, I don't even remember the details of that. So, <laughs> so see, I, I was, well, I was like, okay, I must have, it must have been a miscarriage. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. Well, since you mentioned your paperback, when is that coming out? So we can um, that up. comes out May 14th. So in about seven weeks. So perfect time for yeah. a late Mother's Day gift. If you want to do that. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> okay. Now we've we've brought up Elise, we've brought up Juliet. How did you decide that they were going to be your characters and why? Why were they your focal points for this particular novel? Um I wanted to focus this book on um, friendship and motherhood. Um, there isn't much romance in this book. There is, you know, you see Juliet's relationship with her husband. You see Elise's relationship with her husband. Um, in an earlier draft of the book, I imagined that Elise and Jack Fitzgerald had a little future ahead of them. Um, we mostly took that out of the final draft, but, um, you know, it, this is a book that wasn't supposed to be about romantic love. And so this was two women and I guess three women, if you count Ruth. It kind of represents um, the different choices that women made during the war, the different choices mothers made during the war, um, and the different ways that choosing to deal with those choices um, shaped the rest of their lives, if that made sense. So, you know, they start off with a lot in common. They're both these American women in Paris. They're both um, you know, they're both pregnant. They're both um, relatively recently married. You know, th there's a lot that bonds them together at the beginning and then a lot that bonds them very tightly together once the war begins and they realize that they're stuck here and they're these two American women in Paris and they have to rely upon each other. Um, but I think once their paths begin to separate, the differences that were there all along between the two of them um, begin to rise to the surface. And I think that's when the cracks in the relationship begin to form. So it was just interesting to write two women um, who on the surface were very similar, but ultimately um, weren't that similar at all. You chose to have Elise be an artist. Mm -hmm. Why? And and I know that you talked about it in the author's note. If you can go a little bit more into your research on, on especially the wood sculpting, I thought, I thought that was fantastic. Oh, thank you. You. Yeah, that was such an interesting thing to research. Um, I'm not very good at it. I, I did try my own hand at wood sculpting and I always say I'm lucky I still have all 10 fingers. Like that's how bad I was at it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I knew I wanted her to be an artist. I wanted her to have um, an outlet for her hope, but also an outlet for her grief um, when, when it came down to it. I, I felt like that was really um, an important representation on the page of what she was wrestling with, um, kind of all along. Um, I initially thought of her being a painter. That was kind of the most obvious thing to begin with. Um, but then I remembered that in my 2016 novel, when we meet again, one of the main characters is a painter. And I was like, well, I can't do that again. Like I've already written a painter. Um, and I started thinking about what other form of art would be something that would make sense for her to have found her way into something that maybe people could write off as like, not that, um, not that important or not that skillful, make, you know, make her feel like she's not that important. 
but also something that she could do, um, for instance, when she flees to the town in south central France and she hasn't brought her supplies with her, but with wood and a few um, a few carving tools, she can find her way back to that art, essentially. Um, as far as, when I, I also liked the idea that with wood carving and wood sculpting in particular, it's not just something like, I, I think when I first thought about it, I thought like, oh, it's, you know, you sit there and it, I, I think I thought of whittling. Like I thought of, you know, doing some like fine, delicate work with your hands. Wood sculpting is not that. Wood sculpting is something that you put your entire body into. Um, and I liked that. I liked that idea of her entire body kind of being one with her art and with her grief and with her hope and with her fear. And there was just something very powerful about that to me, the, the whole bodiness of it. Um, as far as the research I did, I read several books about wood sculpting and wood carving. Um, and then I talked to wood sculptors and wood carvers, and in particular, one named um, Mary May, uh, who, um, who was extremely helpful. So I, she helped a lot with any passage in the book that mentions the wood carving. So, um, you know, I did my best to learn it myself and to try to understand, you know, okay, this is how you would do it. So this is how you would describe it. But I would send her the passages and she would correct me with things like, okay, you have her standing with her left foot forward. But if she's right-handed, she would actually stand in this particular carving posture with her right foot forward. So it was things like that, that I didn't have the knowledge to know, but that's why as an author, you have to call people and, um, and kind of say, you know, I'm new at this. If, if you could help me with it, I would appreciate it. So, um, so that was really interesting. And, and like I said, yeah, I, I did do some carving myself, but not very well. <laughs> well, I did love the whole bodiness of Elise in that apartment. You know, she's, pregnant and she's now trying to discover that art again and it just seemed so there was no romance but it's almost like she was so in love with her baby and the art in that moment and that physicalness it just to me that was one of my all-time favorite scenes in the movie because her relationship was so opposite again I say the polar opposites yeah. that she had and Paul had but she did have that's that piece of happiness for herself and I just I thought it was beautiful. Oh, so thanks. I appreciate yeah, that. Thank really, you. I assumed that you had because it was just, it was so well done. Oh, thank you. Now, the other thing that you mentioned with art is that when she has it, there's a feeling of weight, great weight that has been lifted once she's able to do it again. But then also you talk about art having such a great responsibility because of how it can mold society. Yeah. And so I love how you also played with those concepts. Can you talk a little bit more about it? Because I mean, she's an artist, but you really made it flow more, I think, than that into the novel. Well, you know, the 20th century, I think, saw some real art movements that went hand in hand with social change and that went hand in hand with political statements. And that was really interesting to me. I, I mean, there were a lot of people, or I shouldn't say a lot, but there was a community of artists in Paris, for example, in the years leading up to World War II, um, who were very active in politics and in, um, some of them were communists. Some of them were, it became involved immediately in the French resistance um, once war broke out. Um, and and I, I like that idea of people who feel, um, who feel compelled to document life around them and to see it through their own prism are often the same people who, um, take the opportunity to shape life around them, um, off the palette, off the, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, off, off the page of, off, off all of that, um, in, in the real world. And I, I mean, I think for instance, Pablo Picasso, um, was somebody who I would point to as an example of someone who did that. Um, I, I, I just, I liked Elise being involved in that, but I also liked her husband, um, feeling that he was much more of an important man than he actually was um, because of his art, because of his involvement in politics. Um, and I, 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 think, I think that's true also. I think sometimes people are phenomenal artists and don't see that about themselves. And again, opposite, we were talking about opposites, right? I think some people like her husband um, are relatively mediocre ar artists or 
you know, whatever, whatever medium they're working in, um, but have a very inflated opinion of themselves. So that was kind of an interesting, um, an interesting thing to play with as well. On the opposite side, you have Juliet set in a bookstore scene, right? She, she runs a bookstore and that seems to be such a safe place for, for them for, for, a short period of time and then the opposite happens yes. um, and someone they didn't put their name in there but she said you know that she still thinks about the horror of that bookshop um you know and you, you flip that scene why did you want it to be a bookstore first of all and and then how how did you go about creating that safe versus very I mean, it it makes her the daughter. It makes um, Mathilde. Well, I guess she wasn't Mathilde, but it is. It makes her so uneasy. Yeah, when her mother, you know, reproduces it because that feeling just doesn't go away. Well, for me, bookstores are really magical places. I mean, they're places of solace. They're places where we find ourselves. And I, I wanted to give Juliet that when things were good. I mean. The bookstore was a magical place. It was the place she raised her children. It was the place she built with her husband. I mean, the bookstore existed before she came into the picture, but they, you know, they um, uh, they built it into what it was together, essentially. Um, and I think that she felt very strongly, as as do many of us um, who love books, that you can find a world within the pages, and and that you can escape to that world within the pages. Um, so I wanted. I, I think I gave her a lot of feelings about the bookshop that are my feelings about bookshops and libraries. Um, and that, you know, that was intended, I think, as a little bit of a nod to to the all of the bookstores I love, right? Like all of the bookstores and libraries I love. I, I do think they're very magical. But after things go horribly wrong, um, which again happened all over Europe, all over Asia during World War II, I, I mean, it, and it, it, people's lives were blown apart and destroyed in in a moment, you know? I, I mean, that, that's what unfortunately happens when bombs fall from the sky. And, and um, you know, um, I, I think that in areas around the world, you know, we're, we're witnessing now in real time in, in the modern day, what it, what it is like for civilians living in areas um, of great unrest also it, it, it's a horrible feeling when your security in the place that you love um, is taken away from you um, but because the bookstore meant so much to her I think she tries to rebuild it in New York um, as a way to bring back the past it's very unhealthy there's definitely some mental illness going on there um, there's for sure some PTSD going on there um, but I, I think she tries to rebuild it as a way to bring the past back in a very, very unhealthy way. Well, I wonder if you, you know, it would be a horrible scene regardless if bombs dropping on families, but I wonder if it hits us readers a little bit harder because it was a bookstore. And so many people are in the comments saying, I agree about bookstores and libraries. They are a refuge. And, you know, writing a book for readers like us, it just seems like it's even harder. Um, So it was, um, But I did have another question about books and books. You do mention a couple of books in your novels. So one was Baybar, which I think is not a favorite childhood book. uh, Or I don't know if you're if you read it that you read it to your son. And then the other one was Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise, which was on Juliet's nightstand. And I'm always curious why choose the specific title of book that you do to go in your novels. Ah, that's a good question. I actually didn't remember that I had that book in there. Um. As far as the children's books I mentioned, and I, I think there were a couple of other children's books too. I, I just I try to choose stuff that um, that would have been that, that would have been there at the time. You know what I mean? Like it, and and it's it, just going back and looking at um, at old books from the 1930s and early 1940s. Um, those were very realistic books that would have been, excuse me, in in a bookstore, um, and and in a bookstore in France in particular. Um, Fitzgerald's book, I, 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 from what I'm recalling, I can't remember what year that book came out, but I think it would have been the correct timing ish for, um, for Juliet to have it. I can't, I don't think it would have been a new release, but it could have just been a favorite book of hers. Um, and, um, I read all of F. Scott Fitzgerald's books when I was, um, when I was in high school, I loved them. I read the great Gatsby and then just tore through the rest of them and was fascinated in particular by the time he spent in um, in Paris 
uh, with uh, with Hemingway and um, and um, that whole uh, that whole gang in the 1920s. So I, I think I just have a special place in my heart for him. <laughs> well, I, it did seem pretty crazy when Baybar's world seemed more like reality than their actual life. I thought that was a great comparison just to put oh, us yeah. in perspective of what that family was going through. Yeah. Um, you know, there, I do agree. Juliet definitely had some mental illness, um, but she yeah. almost seemed to have a sixth sense too, to her. Like she had a very much a, um, you know, like she knew the baby was going to be a girl. She knew yeah. when the air raids were coming. She knew when Elise was about to walk through the door. Um, was that intentional or did that just come through with her? No, her I, I don't think it was intentional. I, I think the air raids, I think people had a sense when they were coming. Um, no, I, I, I don't think I, I don't think I, I did that consciously, but it's funny. Sometimes I think with characters, um, pieces of the characters, as you get to know them kind of rise to the surface that you don't even realize are there. So that, that could be an example of that. Well, someone mentioned um, in the in the notes, I mean, in the chat box, but I wanted to give you a chance to talk about the connection to the book of lost names, um, how that tie in, if they haven't read it, like I'm not saying, no, pro let's assume people haven't, okay. but can you give just a little non-spoiler explanation about that tie in? Yes. So the book of lost names, which is my 2020 novel is, um, probably at least in the United States, the most popular of my novels. It was a book that people really embraced and thank you to all of you who embraced it. I appreciate that. Um, but it is the book that I've been asked more times than any other book. If I would write a sequel, um, despite by readers. And it, it is a book that doesn't really, there's not really a way to do a sequel that would be, at least in my mind, that would be appropriately satisfying. So I don't think I'm going to write a sequel. But as a nod to all of the readers who were asking me for that, I thought, you know what? It's not a sequel. But if I could send Elise to the same town where the Book of Lost Names unfolds, um, that would be a really fun little moment in this book. That if you've read the Book of Lost Names, you get to that and you're like, oh, I know that town. I know that priest. I know that bookshop owner. Um, so it, it, there are no spoilers. There's no, um, you don't have to read the Book of Lost Names before you read the Paris Daughter or vice versa. It is just a few scenes that take place in the same town um, with a couple of the same peripheral characters. So it's like a little, um, just a, a nod to the readers who supported the Book of Lost Names. Well, I love those Easter eggs. Um, yeah. I appreciate it when Taylor Jenkins Reid did it in her 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I call them the fame day novels. But having those characters cross over and live in the same world, because you are writing World War II, so yeah. the time is there. Yeah. We appreciate it. So uh, I would like to encourage you if you can drop a few more somehow, some way. All right. I'll see what those. I can do. Okay. We love, <laughs> we love them. Um all right. Another question. Um, you said you lived in Paris. First of all, how long were you there? And did that influence you wanting to come back and write about, about Paris? Yeah. So I only lived in Paris for a little while. I was, um, I was 23. I was young, 23 or 24. Um, I was writing for People Magazine at the time. And uh, I found out in April that I had maxed out my hours for the year and couldn't write again for them, couldn't uh, work again for them until the end of August. And so I was in this panic. I was like, what am I going to do for, you know, for these next several months? And um, then I found out because I had accrued all these hours, I had been that, which is why I couldn't work anymore because I had completely run out of hours for the year. I would continue to be paid for the entire summer. Um, I, I just couldn't work. So, um, the day that I found that out, uh, I saw a posting on a journalism website called Media Bistro from a writer my age who was working on her first novel, um, who was living in Paris and whose roommate for the summer had just backed out. So she was looking for another roommate, $600 a month, all utilities included, um, fully furnished, a block and a half from the Eiffel Tower. Um, I, I didn't speak French. I was a Spanish minor in college. I had been there once for a couple of days on a family vacation. Um, I had no reason to think like that I would fall in love with Paris, but I was like, you know what? 
I have nothing to do for the next few months. I'll go to Paris. It's like the most spontaneous thing I've ever done. And it changed my life. It's where I wrote my first book. It's where I gave myself permission to stop going like 100 miles an hour toward a journalism career. I mean, I was just working like 70, 80 hours a week. And like time was just passing me by. Like all these things I wanted to do, like write a book. Um, I wasn't doing because I was like full speed ahead on this like treadmill of journalistic excellency. You know what I mean? So I was like, I needed to just stop and smell the roses and remind myself of what I really wanted to do. And that was the summer that did that for me. Um, so I lived there, I think for about four months, um, but I've gone back countless times since. I mean, I've gone back um, to stay for a little while and write. I've gone back for research. I've gone back for vacation. I've gone back to visit friends. I've spent a lot of time over the last 20 years in Paris. Um, and was that part of why I write about Paris? Yes, it was the city that inspired me. My first, um, my first several books did not take place in Paris, despite having written my first one there. Um, but I, 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 I always wanted to find my way back to it. And um, and now it's something I really, really love writing about. And incidentally, my dad's grandmother um, was a was French. She was a World War I bride. So she was a, a, a young woman who lived in Paris who met an American soldier during World War I um, in Paris. And um, she lived just a few blocks from where I lived in Paris. So I think there was probably a little bit of... Um, even if I didn't know it, a little bit in my own blood that was leading me there all along. <laughs> What's her name? Your the French grandmother? Oh my God! I, you know, I actually cannot think of. Well, it, it's it's my dad's grandmother. So oh, your dad's grandmother. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's so so my um my grandmother was Jackie, and what was okay. her? Um, Leona Dene, I think was her was her mother's name. So I, I I never knew her. I mean, I think she was around when I was a little baby, but I I didn't. Know. I only knew her as great grandma. I didn't know her as like a person who had lived and had an exciting life. This is the perfect time for this quote. I feel like I'm going to quote it right back to you. The universe always leads you to exactly where you are meant to be. Yeah. For though it may be endless, there is a place in it for each and every one of us. And I feel like that applies so much to you. I mean, yeah. you getting to Paris and writing a novel. I don't know. I just, yeah. that's so cool oh, that, that it's within this novel as well. All right, while y'all are getting your questions together, I'm going to ask you rapid fire questions, okay? okay. So just <laughs> whatever comes to your brain. Paris or or Orlando? Oh, Paris. <laughs> Northeast or Southeast US? Ooh. That that's <laughs> impossible. I can't choose. Sorry. <laughs> Hardback or paperback books? Hardback. Baseball, basketball, or hockey? Baseball. Ooh, all the way I have a cousin. My husband's cousin plays in the NHL. So do, don't tell him I said that, but baseball. <laughs> uh, do you like researching or writing more? Writing. Writing articles or novels? Novels, for sure. Who is your literary BFF? Ooh, you mean like a character? No, like as in, in the in author world. Oh, well, obviously, Mary Kay, Patty, and Christy, all, all, all three of them. It's a package deal. <laughs> and what is your, because you mentioned um, indie bookstore. Do you have a favorite? My local indie bookstore is Writer's Block um, in the Orlando area. They're in Winter Park, Florida. They're a great store. I love Oxford Exchange in Tampa. Um, I love Copperfish in Punta Gorda. God, there are so many stores. I love Litchfield Books in Polly's Island, South Carolina. Um Oh my gosh. There, there, there are so many, it's impossible to choose a favorite. There's so many great ones. Thank you so much. And we already have some people raising hands. So Anissa, oh, hi, Anissa. I'm going to ask you to go first. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Anissa? Albie. Thank you. for Hi, hi Kristen. How are hey, you? Hey, good to see you. Good to see you too. I think I owe you a, a message back, Anissa. I think you emailed <laughs> me the other day and I haven't emailed you back. I'm sorry. You are, you are perfectly good. <laughs> Um, my question is not so much about this book, because honestly, I think I've read so many since then, I kind of have to go back and reread it. But I know you you I know you just answered that about research and writing that you prefer writing, but I know you're a master researcher. I know how how deep you've gone into getting people to help you. But I'm curious, is there something that you would like to write about, but you don't think that that person maybe that that, that holds the information is still alive. So is there someone who maybe has passed that you would love to be able to interview to, um, 
Ooh, that's a to, to either give question. you the you know the book or or a part of a book that you feel like maybe that part is missing. That is a really good question, Anissa. I will tell you right now that the book I think I'm gonna going to write next, um, which I won't be, be starting it for another few months, will actually begin in the years before World War One. And this is my first time in a while writing about a time period. Well, maybe my first time ever writing about a time period where the people who lived through it are not still alive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, writing about World War II, I, I do have people I, I can go to. There are still resources. And, and of course, that is, you know, quickly changing, right? Like th that's not going to be the case forever. Um, but yeah, I actually do feel a little bit worried about that just because it's something I, I do really, I think it's the journalist in me. I really like to have those firsthand conversations um, and those where I can actually call and ask you something and, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so I am a little bit, um, I, 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 I will, I will figure it out and I will use the research appropriately and I will get there, but um, it'll be a different experience for me, not being able to ask people who were adults in like 1910, if that makes sense. Good question. Thank you, Anissa. Sure. You always have great questions. Yeah. Very Bye. interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Aubrey. Thanks, Anissa. Well, we're excited to go back uh, into the earlier 1900s with you. All right, yeah. Mary. Thanks. Alan, let's go. Go ahead and ask your question. Hey. Hi, Laura. Hey. Hi, um, hey. Kristen. And I'm sorry, Laura Beth. <laughs> I don't like it when people do that to my name. Um, this is off topic, but this is the first time I've seen your haircut like this, and oh. I really like it. Oh, you oh my gosh me you're talking about yeah oh thank you that's so nice um I don't like it <laughs> oh. <laughs> um so actually you reminded me I'm glad you said this because I sometimes like I never want to forget to to mention this because I think it's important um my hair is shorter because I had cancer last year I had breast cancer and I went through chemotherapy so thank you for giving me the opportunity to say if anyone's overdue for their mammogram, I really want you to call your doctor first thing tomorrow and schedule your mammogram. There are so many treatments. If the worst happens and you do have something, you will get it treated, but you can't get it treated if you don't find it. So um, I, mine was only found because I went in for that mammogram. So um, I will tell you about my hair. Um, I did a cooling cap during chemotherapy to try to keep it, to try to keep my hair but it only kept about, I still lost about 60% of it. So mm -hmm. I have the weirdest hair right now. I have like, this is like, you know, it is what it is. But then there's this whole like mop on top. That's, this is all the regrowth after chemo. And my bangs are my regrowth after chemo. So everything in the front completely fell out. So the bangs are like, this is how far it's come since chemotherapy ended. So Sorry, you just paid me a compliment and I'm like, let's go to a really dark place. But like <laughs> Yeah, but I'm glad I'm glad I gave you that opportunity. And it, I am too. I, I Thank it you. encourages you that I actually really thought it was cute. So since you're yeah. not liking it so much, maybe that'll make you feel better about it. I appreciate it. that. You know what? I think it's just that I don't know what to do with it. I've never had short hair in my entire life. Like I've it, my hair's always been long. So I think it's just a, it's the weirdness of it that it's like two separate sure. lengths right now. And then B, it's like, I just don't know how to do it because it's like new to me. So, but thank you. Thank you very much for the kind words. I really appreciate that. Um, I The other thing I wanted to tell you was um, when I got to the section of the book that came out of Book of Lost Names, I even texted my reading buddy and I said, I feel like I've read this story oh. before. <laughs> and then when I got past that, I was like, no, it's just that section. I must have seen that in another book. And I actually thought it was um, from um, The Way That We Were by Alice Hoffman. Oh, I was thinking okay. that was the book. And then yeah. I was, I, I I said, maybe this was a real life thing that happened. So I really liked it in your note when you oh, said it was good. the book of lost names. And I'm like, duh. No, oh, that's so sense. funny. Well, good. I'm, <laughs> see, I'm glad that means the book of lost names stayed with you if you remembered it. <laughs> so oh, I, the, I love the book of lost names. <laughs> thank you. Okay, my real question okay. is, did you ever think about an epilogue for this book? Because it kind of came to a really quick close, and I'd kind of like to like know a little bit of the rest yeah. of the story. You know, it felt like it ended at the right place for me, but my editor also asked if I wanted to add in an epilogue. And in the in the time since, I have thought I probably should have done that. And in fact, honestly, I probably should have just added one in for the paperback. But um, 
I, I, I kind of go back and forth. It, I feel like it ended where it needed to end. Um, but yes, it did feel like it ended abruptly. I, I agree with you because everything just kind of came together at the end. Um, I, I personally, I would have liked to know more or have more on the page about what happened with um, Elise and Jack in the future. Um, so in an earlier draft of the book, I had it that Elise and Jack had actually known each other vaguely back in those artists, um, art, in, the, in the artists meetings they had back in the 1930s, which is why okay. he looks, they look familiar to each other, which yeah. is the question I get most often about this book. Why do they look familiar to each other? That's from an earlier draft that like they had known each other vaguely, like in passing back then. Um, and, and I liked the idea that sometimes the people that we're meant for are the people who have been in our lives all along. We just didn't know the role they were supposed yeah. to play. Yeah. Um, and so I would have liked maybe to see Elise and Jack begin down the road to something in the future. Cause Elise really deserves a love story, right? Like she's, yeah, yeah life has not been good to Elise. So, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, yes, I, I, part of me wishes I had written an epilogue. Okay. But you know, the ending was it, everything did wrap up and, and we can, with our minds that don't have all, uh, characters running around in them, we can try to <laughs> yes, have the exactly. characters finish or the just story. Show up to author, author chats like this. And I'll just give you the epilogue. Here's what there happens you go. And happily ever after. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the great questions. Is it too late for the paperback? I mean, that was, yeah, oh, it, it, it is, it is, but I did address the Elise and Jack thing, why they look familiar to each other in the updated author's note in the paperback. So I've gotten that question so many times. I'm like, I'm just going to put it in the author's <laughs> notes. All right, we have another question. Go ahead, Caitlin. Hi, it Hi. is a so thrill to meet you. Um, I just want to say you're a tremendous author and I've been reading your books for about 10 years now. And when I get a new Kristen Harmel book, it's like a can of Pringles. I inhale. Oh, thank you. And, and then- <laughs> I try not to read it too fast because I know it's going to be over. And oh then I'll, I'll wait for the next one. <laughs> you, that's so sweet of you. Thank you so much. Okay. Love all your books. Thanks Thank so you. Much. What a kind thing to say. Thank you. Hey, can of Pringles. That's pretty good. I love that. I want that to be like on the cover of my next book. Christina exactly. Armel is like a can of Pringles. It's like a can of Pringles. All right. We have two more questions. All right. Go ahead, Sharon. Sharon, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good to see you. Um, I just wanted to ask of all the people you've met, what author would you most like to meet that you haven't met yet? Ooh, what author would I most like to meet that I haven't met yet? Like actual authors who are still alive. Like we're not talking yeah. like Hemingway or Fitzgerald. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I have never met Chris Bojelian in person and I would really like to. I think he seems like a really, really just I would too. cool, nice guy. <laughs> um, another author who I haven't met but would like to. You know, gosh, through friends and fiction, I feel like I've met almost everybody I've ever, I mean, inclu including Chris, but but so much of it's virtual, just like we're doing now, like it, which I, you sort of feel like you know the people, but I guess it's not the same as as meeting them in person. Um, I don't think there's anyone who I, who we haven't, who I'm like dying to have that we haven't had on friends and fiction yet. Yeah, How about you, you Sharon? Is there anyone you, you're dying to to meet on friends and fiction? Is there anybody I would? Yeah. I don't know. I keep throwing out more old school people that I used to read, like Nora Roberts oh, and yeah. Brown and people like that. People that maybe aren't as current, but are still, you know, writing books to this day. And Oh, you know, actually, that makes me think Judy Bloom would be a good one, too. I think. Oh, yeah. She'd yeah. Be great yep. Too. For sure. Yeah. Good. Good thinking, Sharon. Good question. Thank, Thank you. Sharon. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go quickly because we have Lorna and then one more after that. All right. Go ahead, Lorna. Hi. Hi. Oh. oh, you muted again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now no, you're muted. Whoops. Oh. All right, Lorna, we're going to go to the next one. Oh, no, and I, let's see. Does she hopefully she'll okay. come back. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Kristen. Yeah. Hi, Kristen. This is so exciting. Um, so um, my question would be, what tips would you have for an author who wants to just get started? Um. Oh, great. Great question. And um. Congratulations and good luck if you're getting started, which is awesome. Um, so um, for, do you mean like for writing a first book? 
Um, outline. I am a huge believer in outlines. Even if you don't wind up becoming an outliner in your career, even if you don't wind up being someone who outlines a couple of books in, I think that writing an outline is really super helpful in getting you through a first draft of a first book. Because otherwise, I think it's too easy to get halfway into it. You're at like a 40 or 50,000 word mark, and then you just get completely lost in the middle and don't know the way out. And you put it in a drawer and you never take it out again. Whereas I think if you go in with an outline, um, you give yourself a roadmap and you give yourself a safety blanket and you give yourself a guard against writer's block. So outlining, and I taught myself to outline by outlining other books. So um, I, when I was writing my very first novel, which was 20 years, more than 20 years ago, which is crazy, I chose three books in the genre I wanted to write in. And I outlined each of them. I wrote about a paragraph of summary or about a page of summary per chapter. Um, and then I sat with those outlines so I could understand exactly how the book flowed, how it was assembled, why things worked the way they did. And then I, I basically read over those outlines for a few months until I had the rhythm of those outlines in me. And then I wrote my own outline um, based on that. And that's how I wrote my first novel. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. We have one more. And then I think she has to get a little into bed. So we'll try one more time, Lorna. Oh, Lorna, you're still muted. Try it one more there, time. There you go. There oh, you go. Don't touch anything. Yep. 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 No. Don't touch anything. Okay. <laughs> um, just a question about the end of the book. When you have um, Elise thanking uh, Juliet at the end, but yet... Okay, Matilda can you, doesn't can you hang on one second. I'm okay. So, sorry, Lorna. So, so at, at the end, I have Elise. Yeah. So you have Elise thanking Juliet, <laughs> but Matilda, uh, Matilda doesn't really get to say her piece at the end. Um, I just wonder if that was, um, it, it almost it almost like leads you into like is there going to be more to this story like you said is it going to be elise and jack is it going to move into something else but it just for me i i i just felt like she never got to say anything because she had 17 years taken from her so that is, that is true thought. except you could also look at it from the other perspective which is that she had those years given back to her the the, the daughter mm -hmm. i mean because you know, uh, Juliet really did save her, right? Like, I, I right. mean, if, Ju if Juliet had died, like, God knows what would have happened to the to the little girl, right? Um, right. So, so, it, it, and I think that's the realization that Elise comes to at the end too. That as much as her friend took from her, um, she also gave her back a daughter, safe and sound, if, if which mm -hmm. is what she had asked of her all those years ago. Um, I, I think, as far as not as M Matilde not having her say at the end. I think it was because in my mind, it was Elise who needed to forgive Juliet and Matilde probably had quite a lot of feelings to unpack <laughs> that she hadn't begun to unpack yet. I mean, it, I, I, I can't even imagine like finding out that somebody, you know, it, it, that, but, but that this gut feeling you'd had all along was the correct one. You, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, yes. And and so I, I think maybe in my mind, Matilde um, had a little bit of a journey to go before she could say, articulate the things that Elise probably was more ready to articulate in that moment. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, Kristen, just last questions, then you can hop off. What are you working on next? And what books do you recommend that we read? So I just turned in a book um, about a week ago, um, which I will hopefully be getting back with some edits soon. I suspect I will need to do a lot of work on this one, um, but it is about a jewel thief in World War II Paris and her daughter in the modern day. Um, and it is about um, a bracelet that goes missing the night that the mother is arrested and betrayed. And the same bracelet turns up 75 years later. And the daughter realizes if she can find out um, where the bracelet's been all these years and who's had it, she might find out what happened to her mother and what happened to her sister who, um, who was killed that night too. So, um, so that's yeah, the new title? one. 
Do you have a title? No, with the, my working title for it has been All the Diamonds in Paris, but I don't know if that's going to be our final title. Okay. Or not. We'll so wait, we'll wait. It'll, it'll be out next June. So we'll, we'll probably have a final title. Well, we'll for sure have a final title by this June, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. So, um, and then books I would recommend. Um, let me see. Uh, well, Patty Callahan Henry's The Secret Book of Flora Lee is out in paperback. Um, yep. And I know you are interviewing her um, in Greensboro in just a couple, in like a week or two. Um, so that is a great book. If you didn't get it in a hardcover, I would definitely recommend picking it up when it comes out in paperback. That one's very good. Um, this is a relatively new book, Finding Margaret Fuller by Alison Pataki. I really enjoyed it. We had her on Friends in Fiction recently. Um, I love I love her. She's great. Um, the book is great, um, and it's different. It's it's uh, it's historical fiction set um, in a much earlier time period. It's set during the 1800s, and it's about the real life woman who was essentially the mother of the um, the women's rights movement. So um, it's a really good book. Um, and, and then I would also, I just, spoiler, we're going to be, I'm interviewing Alison Pataki on June 10th. Oh, well then so definitely read, read the book read, and then come, to, and come to Laura Beth's conversation about it. And then finally, I just read an arc of Christy Woodson Harvey's A Happier Life. She's of course my friends in fiction co-host and one of my best friends. This is on sale June 25th. It is her best yet. If you've ever read it and loved anything by Christy Woodson Harvey, this one is even better. And I've loved all of her books, but this is so good. Um, I enjoyed it. And I cried my eyes out at the pool at the Polynesian Hotel at Disney World and look like a crazy person. And it's all Christy's fault, but the book is very good. <laughs> well, Kristen, thank you so much. I'm going to just say that the chat box has been filled with so much love. Uh -huh. um, they just everyone loves your novels and thank you. I'm going to let you hop off before I give, I know you need to go run, but um, I do. I got to put, so put my I'm little really... eight-year-old to bed. At the three weeks, we'll be meeting Amy to Burns to talk about her novel, Mercury, a roofing family's bonds of loyalty are tested when they uncover a long hidden secret at the heart of their blue collar town. So hopefully you can join me then. That's April 15th. Again, Kristen, she was so awesome. Readers out there, thank you so much for joining Please make sure you check out her Instagram. She has a great page um, and uh, you'll find also the latest news on Friends of Fiction. So follow them and attend their live stuff. It's awesome. Um, love for, again, everybody to subscribe to my YouTube, LB the Lover of Books. You're going to find lots of author chats. If you haven't seen it, please subscribe and comment there on what you like and what you'd like to see more of. And um, you can always find me on Instagram or Facebook. Y'all, it's been an awesome night. This has been so great. Thank y'all so much for the great questions and the chat, and I will see everybody in three weeks. Have a great holiday. Bye, everybody.